Hi everyone, this is Dr. Diana Song Song. In this video lesson, we will be talking about fractals and how it appears in nature and in the arts. Okay, let's think about this problem. What is the next figure? Okay, we have to determine first the pattern involving this figure. So first, starting with our straight line, we want to divide the straight line into three equal parts with the middle part replaced by two copies of the middle part at angle 60 degrees and 120 degrees. Meaning to say, we just want to make an equilateral triangle. Okay? So, for example, in this case, we will remove this then that want to use that segment to create a triangle where in this side over here is erased. Okay, I'll just put that there. Meaning to say, we will obtain this one. Now, starting with the first one, we have one line segment. Correct? Okay. For the other one, we have how many line segments we have? One times four. Correct. Okay, so that's the number of segments. Um, and what about the length? Let us assume that. So this is the number of segments. And then this is the perimeter. Or anyway, let's just, okay, let's just put the length. Or yeah, probably just perimeter. Okay, perimeter. Anyway, so, assuming that this one has side length of 1, since we divide everything, we divide it equally into 3 parts, that's 1 third, everything has a length of 1 third, right? So, meaning to say, this one here, we have 4 segments, each of size 1 third, so the length is, so here the length, original length is 1 here, it's now one third times four, or equal to four thirds. Let's look at the next one. So again, we repeat the same process. We divide this in three. Okay. Divide that into three. Divide that into three. Don't forget, we will erase half. Okay, meaning to say, if we clear that up, make, make it cleaner, we will obtain this figure. Now, how many segments do we have? In our original figure, in our original figure, we have four segments, right? Segments, four, nine segments, and we have, what do we have here again? We have four segments, but then... Each, one, two, three, four, okay, each of those four segments will turn, will turn into four smaller segments, right? So, how many segments do we have now? We have four times four segments here. You have 16 segments, correct? Because this part, one segment, it became one, two, three, and four segments. Okay, now what about the perimeter? Now take note that in our previous discussion, this one has a length, has a perimeter of the original. Ah. It has a perimeter of 4 times 1 third or 4 thirds, meaning to say this one has a length of 1 third. But in this case, this is now one third divided by three again, right? Or one third of one third, or one over nine. So the sixteen segments. So we have the perimeter here is four squared times one over three squared. Correct. This is the number of segments. This is the length of each segment. Okay, so that's 4 thirds raised to 2. So that's 
16 over 9. If you repeat this process again, what do you think is the number of segments and the perimeter? Okay? So, if you repeat that, Okay, so let's summarize what we have seen so far. So, if we have for the first iterate, for the first, we started with one segment and then we have a total length of one unit. And then, if we have on the first iteration, so we already have four segments and the total length of four over three. And then, on the second iteration, those four segments, each of those um, segments, turned into four smaller segments so we now have four times four so four squared and a total length of four thirds squared so can you now guess what will be the number of segments on the third iteration it's four cube this is four thirds cube and so on so therefore let's just make this end so if we have for the nth iteration, the total number of segments that we have is 4 raised to the n and a total length of 4 thirds raised to n. So as you can see, as we increase the number of iterations, the total length of our um, figure increases. And okay, so this is the coke edge. Okay, let's now look at the next figure. We have here a triangle. And then, what then? Okay, can you now guess what is the next figure? So let's look at first the pattern that is happening um, in this figure. So we started with an equilateral triangle. And then, we mark the midpoint of each side of the triangle and draw three lines that connect the marks. And then we shade that middle triangle. So we have this and then we get the midpoint, 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 and connect the three midpoints and then shade the triangle. So therefore, we have the second figure, okay? And then, we repeat the same steps to the three new white triangles. So remember, we only do those steps for the white triangle. So this is the uh, figure that we originally had. And then, get the midpoint. Again, midpoint, midpoint, midpoint. Connect. And then shade. Midpoint, midpoint, midpoint. And then, shade. Midpoint, 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 and then shade. Okay, so this is the figure that we have. So if we continue to do the same step again, have this, this, this. So as you can see, as we repeat the process, we begin to fill up the triangle although of course even if you do it even if you do it for an infinite number of times you will never be able to fully cover the entire triangle that is what we call the Sierpinski triangle okay so have you seen such patterns in other places um, we will see later that um, these patterns are everywhere. And what is common among the two items that we discuss? Uh, basically, what happened is that you always just have to repeat the same process. So the things that we have discussed are what we call fractals. What are fractals? A fractal is a never-ending pattern and they are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. I will talk about this term self-similar um, later in the next few slides. Um, they are created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop.
science. Out loud. What does snowflakes and cell phones have in common? The answer is never-ending patterns called fractals. Let me draw a snowflake. I'll start with an equilateral triangle. Then I'll draw another equilateral triangle on the middle of each side. Pull out the middle and repeat the process, this time with 1, 2, 3, 4, times 3, which is 12 sides. If I do this over and over, the shape will look something like this. This is called a Coke snowflake, and it has a special property. No matter where I look or how much I zoom in, I will see the same pattern over and over. Never-ending patterns like this that on any scale, on any level of zoom, look roughly the same are called fractals. We can actually draw a Coke snowflake on the computer by having it repeatedly graph a mathematical equation. Each time we add a triangle, one side of the Coke snowflake will turn into 4. After the first repetition, we'll get 3 times 4 to the first, or 12 sides. After the second repetition, we'll get 3 times 4 to the second, or 48 sides. After repetition number n, we'll have 3 times 4 to the n sides. If we do this an infinite number of times, we'll get infinitely many sides, so the perimeter of the Coke snowflake will be infinite. But the area of the Coke snowflake wouldn't be infinite. If I draw a circle with a finite area around the snowflake, it will fit completely inside no matter how many times we increase the number of sides. So the Coke fractal has an infinite perimeter, but a finite area. In the 1990s, a radio astronomer named Nathan Cohen used the fractal antenna to rethink wireless communications. At the time, Cohen's landlord wouldn't let him put a radio antenna on his roof, so Cohen decided to make a more compact, fractal-like radio antenna instead. But it didn't just hide the antenna from his landlord, it also seemed to work better than the regular ones. Regular antennas have to be cut for one type of signal, and they usually work best when their lengths are certain multiples of their signal's wavelengths. So, FM radio antennas can only pick up FM radio stations, TV antennas can only pick up TV channels, and so on. But fractal antennas are different. As the fractal repeats itself more and more, the fractal antenna can pick up more and more signals, not just one. And because the perimeter of the Coke snowflake grows way faster than its area, the fractal antenna only takes up a quarter of the usual space. But Cohen didn't stop there. He designed a new antenna, this time using a fractal called the Menger sponge. The Menger sponge is kind of like a 3D version of the Coke snowflake. It has infinite surface area, but finite volume. The Menger sponge is sometimes used in cell phone antennas. It can receive all kinds of signals while taking up even less area than a Coke snowflake. Now, these antennas aren't perfect. They're smaller, but they're also very intricate, so they're harder and more expensive to make. And although fractal antennas can receive many different types of signals, they can't always receive each signal as well as an antenna that was cut for it. Cohen's invention was not the first application of fractals. Nature has been doing it forever, and not just with snowflakes. You can see fractals in river systems, lightning bolts, seashells, and even whole galaxies. So many natural systems previously thought off-limits to mathematicians can now be explained in terms of fractals. And by applying nature's best practices, we can then solve real-world problems. Fractal research is changing fields such as biology. For example, MIT scientists discovered that chromatin is a fractal and that keeps DNA from getting tangled. Look around you! What beautiful patterns do you see? Hi, I'm Yulia. Thanks for watching Science Out Loud. Check out these other awesome videos and visit our website. Here are some examples of fractals. We have the Mandelbrot set. We also have the Julia set. So as you can see over here, the pattern, if you zoom in, okay, you will again see the same pattern. So there is a video later that you can watch um, and then it will discuss how the mathematicians were able to come about this Mandelbrot and the Julia set. Okay, so let's look at the properties of fractals. The first property that they have is that they are self-similar. So self-similar objects are objects that appear the same under magnification. They are composed of smaller copies of 
himself. So, for example, if you look at the um, Sierpinski triangle, if you look at this one, okay, this is the small version, this is the bigger version, and then the, right? And then if you continue to zoom in, okay, if you continue to zoom in, you will still see the same pattern, okay? So the second property of fractals is they have a fra uh, they have fraction as a dimension. What do I mean by that? So first, let's look at um, let's start with a one-dimensional figure. So I have here a line, and then I divided the line into two parts. Okay, into two equal parts. So basically, they're just the same lines, except that. This is a smaller version of this one. So the dimension, the dimension of our figure is one. The reduction in size, since we divided the the line, the original line into the equal parts, the reduction in size is one half. And then the number of copies, our n is equal to two because we ended up with two um, figures, two smaller figures, which is which are similar to the um, original figure. Okay. Next, let's look at this one. So we have here a triangle. And then what we want to do is we want for each segment, we again get the midpoint. Okay. We get the midpoint and then um, connect the midpoints. Therefore, we will end up with four squares, which are four smaller squares, which are similar to the original square. So, in this case, the dimension. What is our dimension? This is two-dimensional object because it has a length and a width. So, two. Reduction in size, since we divided each of the segments um, into two, the segments of our triangle is still equal to one half the number of copies with en we ended up with four smaller copies of the original square next let's look at a cube three di a three dimensional object so similarly just what we did in the uh, previous slides we also get the midpoints we also get the midpoints and then we cut the cube Um, along those midpoints. Okay, so when we do that, we will end up with this with this pattern over here. So what happened here? So our dimension, our dimension is three. A reduction in size. Again, we're always looking at one half because we're always dividing the segments into two. And the number of copies. How many smaller copies of the original cube did we end up with? We ended up with with eight equal copies. Okay, so here is a, a summary of um, what we did so far. If we have s equals one half, if s equals one half, we had two copies. If d is equal to one, if d is equal to two, we ended up with four copies. And then if d is equal to 3, we have 8 copies. Now, what will happen if s is equal to 1 third? So, meaning to say, we always divide the segments into 3 equal parts. So, for example, we have a line. Then we divide it into 3 equal parts. What will be the number of copies? So, of course, the answer is 3. What about if dimension is 2? So, if we have a square. We divide it into three equal parts. The segments, we divide the segments into three equal parts. We end up with how many smaller square how many smaller squares? We end up with nine. Can you guess what will be the number of copies if uh, n is uh, if the dimension is three and s is equal to one third? The answer is equal to 27. Now, what is the pattern behind this number? So, for example, here, what is 2? Two? 2 is equal to 
2 raised to 1. So, these are all path powers of 2, right? This is 2 raised to 2. This is 2 raised to 3. In this case, this is 3 raised to 1. This is 3 raised to 2. And lastly, this is 3 raised to Q. So, if we try to generalize that, what can be a general? What is now the relationship between D, the dimension, S, the we call it the magnification factor, and um, N, the number of cup. Okay, so here is again out the table that we obtained. Um, let us now try to decipher what is the relationship between the um, values D, S, and N. What do you think? The answer is this one. The number of copies is equal to the reciprocal of S. Correct? Um, remember, recall that. Okay, here, this is 3, 3, 3, 3 squared, 3 Q, uh, sorry, 3 raised to 1, 3 raised to 2, and 3 raised to 3. So the base here is always equal to 3, and that is the reciprocal of S. Correct? Similarly with this one, the base here is always equal to 2. Correct? And 2 here is the reciprocal of S. So, therefore, N is equal to 1 over S raised to D. But remember, that D here is the D here is the dimension. So, therefore, we want to solve for D. So, if, you, if uh, from your algebra, how do you solve for D if D appears as an exponent? We take the logarithm of both sides, correct? In order for us to bring down the exponent, correct? Because from the properties of logarithm, this exponent over here will go down. So we have d log of 1 over s is equal to log n. So therefore, since we're solving for d, we divide both sides by log of 1 over s. So that's it. Therefore, our d is equal to log of n over log of 1 over s. Okay, let me just write here the, uh, what's this, the formula that we had for d. We have d is equal to log of n over log of 1 over s. Now, n here is the number of copies. So, so that it, so that it will be easy for you to remember, you have to know the value, the what the variable stand for. So, n is the number of copies, and one over s here is our magnification factor. Okay, so remember that. Now, what can we say about this um, this D over here? Now, take note that this number is not a whole number, correct? So that's so it's a fraction, right? So that's why I that's why where the the uh, scientist um, got the the name for fractals. They named it fractals because um, it is a fraction, although it's not a rational number, ha? it's an irrational number. Although it can be expressed as a fraction, but it cannot be expressed as a fraction wherein the numerator and denominator are whole numbers. Okay, so let's have a few exercises. What we want to do is to find the dimension of the following Sierpinski triangle and Coke edge. Let's start with a uh, Sierpinski triangle. Um, here, but we have to get our N and S. Okay, what will be our N here? So, we started with a white triangle and we ended up with three smaller white 
triangles, right? So Rn is 3. What is Rs? Rs here is equal to 1 half, correct? Because remember when we um, constructed the Sierpinski triangle, we divided each of the segments into two equal parts. So using our formula, D is equal to, let me just write that, log n log 1 over s. So this is log of 3 over log of 2. And that's approximately equal to 1.50. Okay, for the coke edge, we have a segment and then um, we divided it into three equal parts, right? So therefore, R N and what do we need? And N S. R S is one third, correct? Because we divided it into three equal parts and then our N, we ended up with four copies of the original segment, correct? So therefore, what is the dimension T is equal to log of the number of copies, which is 4 over log of 3. And that's approximately equal to 1.26, okay? Next property of fractals is that we have already seen this before that they have iterative formation. Uh, meaning to say, we can get the fractal simply if we know the base and our motif. So, for example, in our Sierpinski triangle, this is our base. And then, if we already know that this is the motif, meaning to say that you already know that the pattern is this one. Every time you get a black triangle, you repeat this process. You always have a base and a Motif. Now, for example, this one is a Coke snowflake. Alright? So, what happens here is the difference between a Coke snowflake and a Coke edge. For a Coke edge, we started with just a line segment, right? However, for a, for a Coke snowflake, the base is our triangle. And then, what is the meaning of this part that the motif is this? So, every time you see a segment here, you always make like a version of a coke edge here. So it's like a coke edge, right? And then three, three of those, all right? Put, put them all together. Okay. Okay, next we have, we want to construct the dragon curve. So we have a base, this one, the, the, started with, we start with a line segment. Okay, and then what happened here in the motif? So, this one, you copy it, and then you do it, you copy it, and attach it to itself by 90 degrees. Correct? Okay. So, how will we now construct the dragon curve? So, here is what we are going to do. Let's just try this for the first um, okay, let's let's continue this one after this is the let's iterate this process. So meaning to say we copy this right and then we make a copy of this and then we attach it to itself by 90 degrees. Alright, so how will it look like? Okay, so I have here the original figure that the, the I mean the motif that we have and then I just turned it smaller. Okay, so what will we do? We copy it. Okay, control C, Control V, copy it, right? Just so that you can see that okay, that's it. And then we just rotate it. Oh, but it should be around that point, correct? But when I'm rotating, I want it in such a way that the point it was originally here right okay and then next 
we again copy and then control V and then let me just group this thing group. all right and then we will maybe I should I should just make space okay so this is remember the the second copy all right and then I will attach it to itself we just move because it's moving there you go and then you will continue the same process over and over again so that you can see how does this iteration really works um, let us watch this next video Okay, so we can actually make uh, fractals using um, this uh, link wall from alpha. Let's just go to that one. All right, so you can just you can just go to wallframalpha.com and then you can just type fractals. And then here are the fractals that you can make. So let's just see the first one so the maximum here because this is not paid version the maximum iteration that you can make is five okay so you can make it smaller if you want so for example three so this is the coke snowflake that um you can get all right so you have here the the dimension also okay and the uh, the dimensions after three iterations so it can give you the length the total length and the area okay what else um let's go back let's see what what um what fractals we can, we can also do. what is this the minkowski sausage so let's just make it one iteration compute the Minkowski sausage if you have five iterations the maximum okay so this one all right okay so this is uh, it's also giving you the the dimension this is the this is the um what's this the formula that we had earlier all right so there are many different fractals that you can um get from this 
uh, website. Okay? Okay, let's construct fractals. So, it's just like what we did earlier. So, what is the next figure here? Um, you can see here, this is the base and this is the motif, right? So, what happens is that, what is the pattern here? Um, you're getting two copies of itself, right? And then, you put them on top, right? And then, um, at 45 degree angles with each other. So, what happened there is, this one, you get two small. So, for the next pattern, you get two smaller squares again, and then put it on top. Put it on top. Okay, and then similarly again, from here, you get two smaller versions of itself, correct? Okay, and you will end up with this one. So, this is the last figure that we had. Okay, and then these are the two, right? These are the two, sm the, these are the, what the squares that we added on this iteration. Next. Um, what is happening here? What is the pattern here? What's happening is that so basically, how did we divide the segments? What, although you may not see it here, the original square, you divide it into three equal parts, right? And then connect. And then you make this white. Alright, so basically this one really has... I'm sorry for my lines. They're not straight. Okay. So basically, again, here, the, I, I will just do it like that. Okay? So that's why for every square, you will end up with a smaller square. Right? Smaller square in the middle. You do that for the dark squares. Okay? So what will be the next so, I'll, I will just make one here. Okay, and then this one has... Right, and then smaller square, smaller square, smaller squares. And then what will happen is, you just make nine copies of this one and put it there. Okay? This is the answer that you will from the original. That's the original. Then this is the end. Now, where can we find fractals? We can find fractals in nature and in arts. So, for example, in nature, uh, this one. Um, for example, look at the leaves here. Alright? As you can see here, the branching of the leaves when you... Um, smaller versions of itself they are self similar even snowflakes and even for for this leaf. meaning to say if you zoom in inside you will again get the same pattern correct same also with uh, a sunflower in the human body so in our the branching of the veins and arteries um, anyway this in our lungs whatever you call them them I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not good in biology but if you can see the patterns right so we even have fractals in our so this is the big version like this is the motif the base and then the motif that's how the branching goes and then it it always repeats itself in architecture also for this one right this one this this again it keeps getting smaller and smaller but basically they are just you can also see fractals in art so these are examples of um, art that are done using fractals you can also make your own fractals um, using paint let's watch the next video
Thank you for watching my video. For more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And don't forget also to hit the bell button for notification updates. See you on the next video!